he instructed us that they're fully loaded and somebody will be harmed if you do anything, pointing at it, you know, you know what I mean? Like I said, when we lived on the ranch, we had rifles, we had pistol. The pistol stayed on top of the refrigerator, which you could pick it up as you were going out the door. The rifles was stood beside the door. You could just grab them as you went out it. But everybody knew and, where they was, didn't they? Yeah, Mark? and mother and daddy and I, all three were dead eye dick when it came to shooting them. And uh, one time this guy and his wife and their little boy came over from town and he picked the pistol up off the refrigerator and he was just waving it around and pointing it at his wife and little, little boy and mother and I both standing there begging him. It is loaded. Don't do that. Put it up. Well, he wouldn't believe it. So he kept waving around. Finally, I guess we convinced him or something. He put it back on the refrigerator. A few minutes later, daddy walked in. <clears throat> I told him what happened and he just took it and broke it down and then and, and Marvin could see it was fully loaded and he had been pointing it at his wife and child. Okay, Dean, did you have something? I just want to end it with God is God is love. I don't want all this right. violence and talk to disrupt the day because it's a very, very blessed day and um love. Yeah. On here. Start I just today. have one. As far as it is possible, live peaceable with all men. If uh, our father doesn't allow that uh, because the people won't allow that, then, you know, we need to pray and, and know that we're in his hand to do only as he would do. Mm -hmm. He'll lead us to what to do in that moment, especially if we're praying for it. Um, I, I don't, the question that was asked a little earlier um, you know, I've been not in Vietnam, but in situations where, uh, and I put myself there, uh, in robbing criminals of their drugs and their guns and their money because they couldn't call the police and it could have instantly turned into something like that. And they would have had to kill me to stop me. But anyway, all that, that's a totally different life. But the whole idea is, um, Believe in him, trust him, and when he says he's going to, believe him, and just amen. Trust him and trust his love, and trust the truth, and know that the truth is there for us, and he's coming soon. We got to be ready. Can I quote a, a text? We're gonna need this, and we we can have it, but it's based. It's very conditional. Uh, Isaiah fifty four seventeen, and um. As we see things changing rapidly in our country, we're going to need this. It says that no weapon that is formed against you will prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. We have to have his righteousness, genuine article. It can't be uh, cheap grace or righteousness, and, and also his servants. And, you know, looking on this message that we were looking at, are you his servant and do you have his righteousness if you attribute to the most high the acts of Satan and vice versa? Will we have that covenant covering? And um, so, friends, uh, let's just be sure we're in his hands. I want him. I want to think like him. I think too much like me. And um, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we can have more and more of that. So mm -hmm. if we can pray for that, then. He'll guide us in those extreme situations. Okay. And hi, Millie. We're glad you're back. You said something about um, the hurricane was getting to you. See if she can say something. She says, oh, yeah. Lee, was the power has been was in and out for a while. Now it's been out for a couple, couple three hours. And wow. yeah, it's the, yeah, it's still out. And the, you know, the cable's out. So it's, I mean, we've been warned for days it was coming. That's why they canceled church this morning. Well, stay safe. Yeah, we are. <laughs> and we're just hoping other people stay off the roads and don't get themselves in trouble so we don't get called out to rescue them. That's <laughs> true. What state is this in, Millie? What state are you in? Maine. Pardon me? 
We are in the state of Maine. State up of near, Maine? I remember it was off yeah. The oh, wow. Yeah, it was showing. It was going that way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, dear. we're up near near Arcadia National Park. Due west of, uh, Nova Scotia. And it's going to slam into Nova Scotia, you know, in Canada very shortly. And that's just about straight east of us. <laughs> Kimber, go ahead. We're ready. Okay. I guess I'm I'm here. Well, I would like to start with a word of prayer before we get going here. Father, we thank you for giving us this Sabbath. Um, we want to pray for those people that are in the path of that hurricane that they would be safe, your your people especially. And um, we just appreciate that you're there to uh, watch out for us. And as we talk about some of your ways of defending and, and strengthening us, I just pray that you'd give me the right things to say and share and help people to understand and know how to apply what you have said. Be with us as we... Go into this study now. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to get my screen up here and hopefully it'll work. Okay. There, you see the picture? Yes, yes we do. Okay. I always like this verse. It's just kind of a basic reassurance for just about anything. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31. So no matter what is going on, whether it's the devil after us or whether it's a hurricane coming or whether it's being out on the road or whatever it is, God is on our side. We don't need to be worrying about anything. We'll start in uh, 1 Samuel 17, and it's kind of a, a situation where the people of Israel were quite worried. 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 1, says there, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side and there was a valley between them. And I went looking for a little bit of current information on this. Here we have a satellite picture of Israel and you can see where Jerusalem is and where Bethlehem is. And off to the left side there is the actual spot where this battle was going on between the people of Israel and the Philistines. And if we zoom in on that spot, we can see the Valley of Elah and the, the hill that Israel was on and the ridge that the Philistines were on. You have Azekah on the upper left side there and Shoko on the lower right side. And these are actual archaeological sites they've excavated there. They, they know what these are. <clears throat> and so this is where the Philistines were, were camped, almost surrounding Israel, and the Valley of Elah between them. And down in the valley there is the little, little brook of Elah. And here's some more pictures of that area. Now it's a lot of farmland in there, but you can see the ridge where the Israelites were on and also the ridge where the Philistines were. And that little area of trees has a little stream going through it. That's the brook Elah between the two uh, sides of the armies there. This is looking the other direction. This is looking east. You have some orchards there. You can see the little brook going through the line of trees. And it gives you an idea of what that countryside looked like. Of course, back in the days when this battle was taking place, there were probably not 
fields there. It may have been just bushes and, and trees through that whole area. We don't know really what it looked like back then. But uh, here's a shot looking straight north to the ridge where the Israelites were, the, the hill where they were camped. <clears throat> so it kind of gives you a perspective of uh, what they were dealing with there. And it says there in 1 Samuel 17, 4, And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And according to some of the, the information I could find, that Goliath was probably about nine feet and nine inches tall, pretty close to 10 feet tall. At, at that size of a body, he may have weighed up to 700 pounds. So he was a big guy. He was, you know probably two feet higher than most ceilings in, in houses. And it says there that he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. So just his coat of mail, which you see a picture of a typical coat of mail there, uh, just his coat of mail might have weighed close to 160 pounds. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And uh, the Hebrew word there that's translated target isn't really what you'd think of as a, as a target to aim at. It's more likely that it was a javelin, a little short spear that he had handy in case he needed to uh, throw it or whatever. Uh, and that was strapped to his, to his back between his shoulders. <clears throat> and it goes on and says, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And again, according to the measurements that I was able to find, that was about 18 pounds. If you've ever watched Olympics, uh, they have one of the competitions where they throw the shot put. The shot put weighs 16 pounds. Uh, it's about the size of a grapefruit. So Goliath's spearhead was bigger than that, 18 pounds. And it says, and one bearing a shield went before him. And so all of his armor, the coat of mail, and all of the stuff that he had on could have weighed as much as 250 pounds, just what he was wearing. Plus his, uh, you know, the size of his body, he was a pretty formidable soldier. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And you, <clears throat> servants of Saul... Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall you be our servants and serve us. And that was kind of a typical uh, situation rather than both armies getting into a, a major fight. They would sometimes have a few men. In this case, he was just asking for one to come out and fight him. And whoever won that, that single little battle between the two of them, uh, whoever won that would determine who won the war. And he promised that uh, if uh, whoever came out and fought with him would win, then the Philistines would, would be servants of Israel. Well, that didn't really turn out that way. But anyway, um, he says, and, and the Bible says, and the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. So he was uh, boasting about his greatness and he was uh, berating the, the armies of Israel and, uh, you know, just putting them down, all kinds of verbal abuse. And he says, give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid, and they would not go down to meet him. Now, in the description that we have of Saul, it says that Saul was head and shoulders above the other men of Israel. So he was probably the giant in Israel. He might have been close to seven feet tall himself, but he was still way smaller than Goliath, and uh, he wasn't willing to go out there. Well, in the story, as it goes on there in 1 Samuel 17, we have David coming to see his brothers and bring them some food supplies. And he, while he was visiting with his brothers, Goliath came out and gave his challenge and everybody got scared again, and uh, David expressed indignation that this character, this jerk you might call him nowadays, was allowed to insult God and the people of Israel. 
And uh, someone apparently overheard that and went and told Saul what David had said. And Saul asked to bring him in. And when Saul, when he met with Saul, he offered to go out and fight Goliath. And of course, that was uh, kind of a almost an unheard of thing. And it goes on there. The story carries on in verse 33. And Saul said to David, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And we don't know just how old David was, but he might have been in his late teens, maybe early 20s, and he wasn't a very big man. And uh, and he's, you know, Saul is telling him, you know, you're just a young guy, and this Goliath has probably been trained for war since he was maybe even younger than you, how could you possibly go out against him? <clears throat> but David said to Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. I have a hard time imagining anybody getting close enough to a lion to grab him by his beard, and then being able to kill him on the spot. But that's what David was able to do. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. <clears throat> so he had confidence in what God could do. And uh, Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Now, I, I don't really think that, that David was bragging when he was telling his experience with the lion and the bear. He was just describing what God had done for him. <clears throat> and he had confidence that God would do something similar in this situation. But Saul didn't really get the point, And he insisted that David needed some real armor. You know, this... this uh, thing about uh, just going out there and, and you know fighting the giant that, that's not going to work you need some real armor and so he gave uh, David his own armor but since Saul was such a big man and David was just average and maybe may have been even smaller than others we don't know how big he was but the armor didn't fit him and he he thought I don't need this anyway I've got something better than that I have better protection than than this could ever give me and it kind of reminded me of what it says in Psalm 18, verses 2 and 3. It says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. And I can just imagine those kind of thoughts going through David's mind. He was thinking, you know, I don't need all this armor on. It doesn't fit me anyway. And going on in, in Psalm 18, verse 3, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. So he was depending on that kind of protection when he went out against Goliath. <clears throat> so the story goes on in verse 41. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David. And the man that bare the shield went before him. Now, like I said, you know, that area we saw on the satellite picture there, there's little bushes and trees along the stream there. Uh, there might have been, you know, various bushes and stuff through that whole valley. And, and Goliath may not have seen David immediately, but it says that David went down to the little stream there and picked out five stones. And then he went out to meet Goliath. Well, he might have come out of the bushes and trees there. And when Goliath saw David, says, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? So David may have had his, his shepherd's staff there, and uh, Goliath was rather offended that such a puny little guy would come out to fight him. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, and I will smite thee. No, in the name of the Lord of hosts, and the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. 
This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk down into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So the one vital spot that Goliath didn't have protection on was his forehead. And that's where David aimed. And when I was a kid, I made a sling, kind of, you know, the best copy that I could make of something that David may have had. And I played around with it a little bit. And you could, you could really sling a stone pretty hard and it would zing when it went through the air. And I never got to be a very good aim with it, but I, I knew that you could throw a stone pretty hard. And, uh, you know, there wouldn't be much of a defense against that in the forehead. So David was saying to Goliath, you are God's enemy, and this is a battle between you and him. He's stronger than you are, and your weapons don't mean much to him. You and your, your whole army are going to lose. And so David ran to meet Goliath. And, uh, you know, that's always kind of a, kind of a, a great story to, to tell young kids how that this young man went out against this formidable giant and won the battle. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about us doing battle, and we're going to look at the armor of God. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll go through some of the verses there, Ephesians 6 and starting in verse 10. And Paul says there, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You know, David was no match for Goliath, just physically. But he could say, I come to you in the name of the Lord. And so in that, with that kind of uh, reinforcement, he felt safe. And in Proverbs 18, verse 10, it says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. And so we can have confidence in what God can do for us. So going on in Ephesians 6, verse 11, Paul says there, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And that expression, the wiles of the devil, you know, that's kind of like uh, his strategy, his trickery. You know, the devil is, a, is a, a trickster, you might say. And he uses all kinds of um, sneaky methods to get to us. He's a terrorist and a sniper. He uses lures and he sets booby traps and, and snares and uh, sometimes really what appears to be harmless things can have some pretty terrible results. You know, when, when God created the trees in the garden, it says there in Genesis that the trees were good for food and pleasant to the eyes. Well, when Eve came around to the middle of the garden and was looking at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the snake started talking to her. He made the tree of knowledge of good and evil look better than all the trees in the garden because he said, this will give you the knowledge of good and evil. You'll be as God, knowing good and evil. And so he was making it sound like that tree was better than any other tree in the garden. All the other trees were good. They looked really nice and they were good for food, but this one is going to make you smart. And so he convinced her that this one was better. Well, we also have the story of uh, when the people of Israel conquered the city of Jericho and Achan saw some of the goods in the city of Jericho and they looked pretty good to him. And so he took some of them, but we know the result of that. And we have the story of David and Bathsheba. Bathsheba was beautiful, but uh, there was some pretty serious results that came from that. There was a hook inside the bait. And so we got to be really careful what we're dealing with. So we go on in Ephesians 6 there to verse 12. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're dealing with enemies that are way beyond our ability to handle. You know, we're not just dealing with people. We're dealing with invisible powers and demons that have way more power and way more uh, knowledge than we have. They've been around for over 6,000 years, and they've been studying human nature, and they know just what it takes to to uh, get us to take the bait. We're inexperienced, just like David was against Goliath. He was young, probably in his late teens or early 20s, and Goliath had been a soldier since he was that age, and so David was no match for him, and we're no match for the demons. <clears throat> they can do things since they're invisible, they can do things and they can be in places that uh, we don't know about. There's a book, maybe some of you have read it. It's called A Thousand Shall Fall. It's a story of Franz Hazel, a uh, Seventh-day Adventist pastor who got uh, drafted into Hitler's army in World War II. And he got sent out to the front lines. And uh, there's you know incredible stories in there of miracles that happened. Well, one of the stories, it isn't uh, something that happened to uh, Brother Hazel himself, but it's a story of a situation where there was another German unit there, and they were, you know, they were they were on the Russian front and trying to move forward, and they got they were in in, in a situation where a Russian uh, convoy of tanks moved in. And so the German army had to just get out of there as quick as they could. But one of the soldiers in the German army got left behind and he couldn't catch up to his unit. And so he just hid in the bushes beside the road, hoping that the Russians wouldn't find him. Well, the Russians came along with their tanks and uh, they were going on the road right next to where he was hiding. And they were in, you know, pursuing after the German unit there. And uh, this. German soldier happened to have an anti-tank rifle. And he knew that the Russian tanks were well armored in the front and on the sides, but he also knew that they had a vulnerable spot in the back. They didn't have as much protection in the back. And so as they moved by on the road past him and got headed down the road away from him, he fired his anti-tank rifle into the ammunition cartridge on the back of the tank and the whole tank would explode. And so he did that one after another with those with those Russian tanks. And the Russians real, realized there, you know, there's something going on here and they couldn't identify where this was coming from. And they finally just panicked and abandoned their tanks and ran. And basically he stopped the whole convoy of Russian tanks single-handedly. Well, that's kind of the way the devil gets to us sometimes. He knows our vulnerable spots. He knows our weaknesses. And he attacks from his hiding place sometimes when and where we're most vulnerable. And so we got we to gotta be aware that that's our situation. We have to be ready for stuff like that. Well, in Ephesians 6, verse 13, Paul implores his readers, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And the word withstand there means to stand up against the devil. And when it's all over, you will still be standing, just like when in, in the, the battle between David and Goliath, when it was all over, David was still standing and Goliath was down. So, Let's look at the armor of God. And, you know, I've, I've got some ideas here. I read various things and kind of got put some ideas together of how these different articles of armor can apply to us. And there's other ways of applying these things. These are just some thoughts that I had just to kind of uh, share some thoughts on this. And so we'll, we'll look at some of those articles of armor. So in verse 14, it says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So the belt of truth, the belt um, 
you know, God's word is truth. What God says is true. And we can depend on that. If we claim to be on his side in the battle, we need to be in agreement with what he says. We can't be going by human theories or traditions. Our whole religion is based on what God says. You know, we're not, we're not going by just uh, traditions that have been handed down to us or theories about God. We are standing on what God himself has told us. And uh, that is truth. And no matter what the devil comes up with, with deceptions and frauds and all that, we depend on truth to keep everything else in perspective. You know, it's kind of like the belt holds everything else in its proper place. <clears throat> and no matter how much God's word is attacked, his truth will stand. Everything else might crumble and fall, but God's truth stands and, and holds in place. So the belt of truth kind of helps keep everything else in proper perspective. Well, we have the breastplate of righteousness. And, uh, you know, one way of thinking about righteousness is that it's to be on the right side of the law, to be justified, to be declared innocent. Well, we know that we are not really innocent, but God does justify us. He declares us to be innocent through Jesus' sacrifice. So in God's sight, we're considered not guilty. Well, Satan comes along, and his name, it's actually a Hebrew name, Satan. It means the accuser. He is our prosecuting or our prosecution in the court case. He's the one that's against us. He's our opponent in the court case. And if we were st still considered guilty, he would have a case against us. But we have been declared not guilty, or we have been justified. Um, can't really say we're, we're innocent. We aren't actually innocent, but we have been declared not guilty by God. And so Satan's accusations fall apart. And you could say he, he, his, the, the judge throws his case out of the court. And we kind of have an example of that in, in a couple places in the Bible. In Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, we have a, a kind of a court case there. And it says, and he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, and his name there means the accuser, standing at his right hand to, uh, to resist him. And it means to accuse him. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is, this, is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? And so it's like God is standing as the judge. The Lord is the judge. And he tells Satan, you be quiet. You don't have a case against Joshua here. And so he basically tells him, you know, you, you have no place in this court. Well, then in, in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. So it's there again, it's kind of like a court case. The accuser is cast down. He's thrown out of court. He doesn't have a case against us. So the breastplate is sort of like a bulletproof vest, you know, made out of Kevlar and whatever else they put in there to, to stop bullets. We are declared righteous. And so Satan's accusations cannot penetrate and get us. We have on uh, 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 an armor that protects all of our vital organs. We are kept alive by God declaring us righteous. And that can give us reassurance that uh, we're okay. We will stay alive spiritually because he has declared that we're righteous. So that's one application of the breastplate of righteousness well we go on in verse 15 there and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace and we have a picture here of some footwear that might have been like a roman soldier would have worn some pretty uh, heavy duty sandals and they typically had some metal spikes on the bottom to give them traction kind of like uh, 
football players have spiked shoes and golfers wear have spikes on their shoes so that they have good traction when they're standing in place they don't slip around or if they have to run they have good traction for running that was the soldier's footwear well they also had on the greaves which are protection for the shins so their their legs and, and feet were protected <clears throat> Soldiers always have rugged footwear. Well, it says, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So our feet are protected with the gospel of peace. Well, in the battles of life, we don't need to be afraid. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, peace I leave with you. And my peace I give unto you. John 14, 27. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And when the angels came to the shepherds on the night that Jesus was born, they said, I bring you good tidings, which the word there is gospel, or, you know, news of good. Good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. And they said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, good will toward men. You know, part of the gospel, a big share of the gospel is that we can have peace with God. He has justified us. He has forgiven us. We are at peace with him. And so that's part of the good news. And, you know, for us to, to go through life with that reassurance that we have peace with God and we can share that with other people too, you know, you can have peace with God. It's good news. And, you know, as you think about it, you know, having that kind of message gives us uh, stability in life. No matter what's going on, there can be turmoil all around us, all kinds of things falling apart, but we can have peace with God, and that gives us some stability. Um, and here in 1 Peter 3.15, Peter says to his, his readers, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you, a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So as we can share with other people what kind of hope we have, you know, it can be it can be good news for them too. You know, we're we're ambassadors for God and sharing this with other people, you know, back in our in our verse there in Ephesians 6, it says, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. So as we meet other people, if we're prepared to share with them the the good news that they can have peace with God too, you know, it's it's uh, brings stability in their life too. Okay, we go on in uh, verse sixteen. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And uh, that little phrase, above all, uh, kind of the the real meaning of it is not not above your head, but in all circumstances, in all situations, take the shield of faith. You know, our faith is, uh, you know, it's trust, it's confidence in God, it's, it's reassurance, it's, it's uh, dependence on God for whatever we might need, and it, it protects us in all directions. And so, you know, the shield for the soldier, he could you know, he could shield on his left side or he could shield on the right side or whatever. He could move that shield around to protect him from whatever was coming from any direction. And, uh, you know, Satan fires at us from unexpected places. Can you see the two snipers in this picture? You know, they're, they're pretty well hidden. And, you know, that's what Satan does. He hides and he doesn't want us to know where he's at or what he's up to, <clears throat> but he fires at us with all kinds of things, with suggestions of fear and discouragement and anger and impatience and temptations that we're not expecting. You know, things pop up that that can get our mind off of what where we should be thinking. And it's kind of like the the bullets from a sniper; they come from unexpected places. Well, Paul didn't know about bullets, but he sure knew about the the fiery darts that uh, the soldiers back in those days would use. They'd, they'd put something burnable on the end of their arrows and fire it at the enemy, and whatever the arrow hit 
would start on fire then. And uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting uh, metaphor because the longer that that fire has to burn, the harder it is to put out. And you know, all these things that Satan can can throw at us, all these feelings of fear and discouragement or anger or whatever, the longer we allow those feelings in our life, the harder they are to get to get put away. And so we need we need our our faith and our confidence in God and our connection with God to deal with those things, no matter what direction they come from, that we can handle those with God's help. We need to be shielded from things like that, you know, so that we don't have to get knocked down when we're hit by those things, by having trust and dependence on God. You know, Jesus said to his disciples, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. You know, Jesus was connected with God. And so no matter what Satan would fire at him, it's like it didn't have any effect on him because he was he was protected with his shield of faith. And 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, our, our dependence on God. 1 John 5, 18. We know that who, what, whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. And that little word there, he keepeth himself, it means he guards himself. You're on guard, you know, watching for what the devil might come up with and having that shield of faith to protect yourself, you know, you know on any side, no matter what Satan throws at you. We need that constant protection in all directions. Okay, our next verse. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, the helmet of salvation. What does the helmet protect? Well, it protects our head. Well, what, what is in our head that we need protection for? Well, there's thoughts in our head. You know, and this is one application to this. You know, if, if the devil can, can hit our head and, and get us to think negative thoughts, then he he can a lot of times get us, you know. And in 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 a battle, if the soldiers feel like they're going to lose, they just you know there's a tendency to give up, you know. When when the Philistine army saw Goliath go down, I mean he was their champion. If anybody could knock him down, the rest of the army didn't stand a chance. And so the whole Philistine army panicked and ran. So, you know, their thoughts were totally negative. We're going to lose. We got to get out of here. Well, we have the story of Gideon when he was facing the Midianites with his little army of 300 and the, and the Midianites were 120,000 or whatever it was. And, you know, Gideon was, was really nervous about this situation. Well, God told him, go down into the camp of the Midianites. I'll give you some reassurance. And so he and his, his uh, close helper, went down there, and they overheard a couple of the Midianites talking in the tent. One of them had a dream of a little loaf of bread coming down and hitting one of the tents of the Midianites and knocking it over. And he said, this is none other than the, than the forces of Gideon. You know, and basically, you know, Gideon got the idea, we're going to win. And so he was encouraged. And so he went back to his army and, he, you know, he set them up, organized them, and, uh, you know, he was encouraged by the thought, we're going to win. <clears throat> and so, you know, the idea of either having negative thoughts about losing or positive thoughts about winning, you know, if we know that we're going to be saved in the end, no matter what happens, we have salvation. You know, that's like, no matter what happens, we win. And, you know, In, in, in the battles that we have, we always come out on top if, if we're on God's side. Even if, even if things look bad, you know, Jesus was telling his disciples about the end times in Luke 21. And he said, you're, you know, there's, there's going to be persecution. You're going to be betrayed. Some of you are going to be killed. But two verses later, he says, 
but not a hair of your head is going to perish. And so it's like, even if you're killed, it doesn't matter. You're saved. So knowing that, that we are saved can give us courage. Here in Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, that list includes just about anything that we would be afraid of or anything that could hurt us or anything that could knock us down or whatever. But Paul is saying it doesn't matter. All of these things mean nothing because God still loves us and we're still under his protection. We still have salvation. The helmet of salvation protects us. Well, then we have the sword. And, you know, a sword is a, typically a weapon. And in some cases, we need a weapon to protect ourselves from the devil. And it's the word of God. You know, Jesus, uh, he said, when the devil came to him, he used the word of God as his protection. He said, it is written, and the devil had to back off. Well, here in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Well, uh, a sharp sword is a weapon to protect yourself. And sometimes the, the spirit, you know, that's the word of God is called the, the sword of the spirit. Sometimes the spirit uses the word of God like a sword, but sometimes he uses it like a scalpel. You know, when a surgeon is doing surgery, he uses a very sharp scalpel to very carefully cut. And that's the way the spirit uses God's word sometimes in very, very precise careful ways you know and there there are times when we maybe need the word of god <clears throat> to protect us from the devil's strategies and whatever he's up to but sometimes the word of god needs to be used like a scalpel very carefully and it's more like the spirit uses it like that and we need to just kind of back out of the way and let the spirit use the word of god as a scalpel very precisely we can't go in just slashing back and forth like a machete because there are many times when we don't know how to use the word of God. We need to depend on the spirit to do the converting and the changing and applying the word of God properly. So the word of God is quick and powerful. It has its life and its power. Uh, you know, human words, they might sound real wise, you know, the sayings of Confucius or the sayings of some famous person, they might sound wise and, and really profound, but they don't have life and power like God's word has. You know, and here in this verse in Hebrews 4.12, it says the word of God is quick. Well, that's not, that doesn't mean that it's fast. It means that it has life. That's what that word means. It's quick. It has life. The word of God is living and powerful. And so we need to depend on how the spirit uses it to, to have it used properly. Well, another part of this whole uh, defense that Paul is talking about here is prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all, all saints. <clears throat> and, you know, prayer is our line of communication with heaven. We need it. And in this picture, we have a modern helmet, and you see the microphone there. And this soldier would be in touch with, with his uh, commander, his uh, command post headquarters. And that's what, what we need. You know, there are times when a soldier needs to, to hear his orders, or he needs to call for reinforcements or for supplies or for counsel or whatever it is. You know, he's got a communication device there that he can keep in touch with somebody that knows what's going on. And, you know, that's what prayer is for. That's our connection. That's our communication device with our heavenly command post. And, you know, it uses the word praying always with all prayer. You know, praying at all times, in all situations, 
and all kinds of prayer, whether it's private prayer or group prayer or family prayer or, you know, public, whatever it is, you know, there's all kinds of different times when we need prayer. And sometimes they're, they're, you know, common, ordinary, everyday things. And sometimes they're out of the ordinary, you know, some emergency comes up and we need, we need help in an emergency. Well, prayer is there in all those situations. And we need to make sure that we keep that line of communication open. We need to always have a, have a, a good connection. <clears throat> I have a quote here from Review and Herald. We need a close connection with God. We are not safe a moment unless guided and controlled by the Holy Spirit. The soul should be often uplifted to God in prayer, even while we are engaged in our business vocations. These silent prayers rise like precious incense before the throne of grace. Satan is baffled. He cannot overcome the Christian whose heart is thus stayed upon God. No hellish arts can destroy his peace. All the promises of God's word, all the power of divine grace, all the resources of Jehovah are pledged to secure his deliverance. You know, it's, it's so important to keep our, our line of communication open with God because we, we're always going to need something. And we need him to, to be there for us. Well, in, in closing here, we'll just go, go over a quick summary of things. These different articles of defense in our armor. We have the belt of truth. And a belt is, is usually pretty strong. It's made to hold out other things in their proper place. And a soldier's belt, here we have a modern soldier's belt. He has all kinds of things connected to it. Uh, weapons and supplies and ammunition and everything is on his belt. Well, whatever God says or reveals is true and it's reliable and it provides what we need to order our lives. You know, we need God's truth to help us. Tradition can be misleading. Um, sometimes tradition gets to be totally meaningless. Uh, human theories can change. Sometimes they're completely wrong. We need God's truth. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth to all generations. Psalm 100 verse 5. No matter how hard truth is attacked, it's always truth. It's always, it always stands. No matter what people try to do to it, truth stands. Okay, we have the breastplate of righteousness. It's like a bulletproof vest. It protects all of our vital organs. All it, it protects our life, our righteousness. We have been declared righteous by God. We have his guarantee that we have life through that righteousness, through our connection with him. The Supreme Court judge of the universe has declared us righteous, and he's made a promise to give us life. <clears throat> John 5, 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, that's a promise, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. We have been declared righteous, and we have the promise of life, and so we can go through whatever is coming, and uh, we have confidence in what God has promised. Okay, we have shoes on our feet. The soldier has rugged footwear. He has uh, grips on the bottom of his shoes for to be sure-footed, and uh, he needs that protection and that traction as he's dealing with the things that he faces in battle. And the gospel gives us a sense of peace and stability. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have this, this peace and stability in our lives that no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. We have peace with God. He's going to take care of things. Everything is going to be okay. We have the shield of faith. A shield can be moved around to different directions, no matter what's coming at us. Our faith, our connection, our trust, our commitment, our reassurance in God can protect us from 
all kinds of things. And in Psalm 56, verse 3 and 4, it says, What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh, flesh can do unto me. And we have that, that uh, reassurance from God. He's going to take care of us. No matter what happens, no matter what the devil throws at us, no matter what discouragements come, no matter what anything, he's there for us. <clears throat> we have the helmet of salvation. And uh, the, self, the, the helmet protects the head. And, you know, in our, in our thought processes, we can know that we have assurance of salvation no matter what happens we will come out on top. We will be saved. <clears throat> Even if we die, we have the assurance of salvation. And it kind of reminds me of uh, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they were facing Nebuchadnezzar and uh, they had refused to bow to the image that he had there and he was threatening them with the furnace and they could probably see the furnace in the background and uh, Nebuchadnezzar was saying, you know, if you don't do go along with what I say, you're going to end up in the furnace. But they could re respond to that. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. So their, their assurance was he is able to deliver us. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king, from Daniel 3, verse 17. So they were, they had the reassurance that no matter what happened, even if they went into the furnace, it was going to be okay because they had confidence in God's deliverance. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. So the, the hope of what we look forward to, the, the salvation that, that God has promised gives us hope no matter what's going on. We have that hope. Okay, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. And, uh, you know, the sword is both an offensive and a defensive instrument. I, I kind of hesitate to, to call it a weapon. It is a weapon in, in some situations, but it's an instrument that can be used. And the word of God is an instrument that we can use for defending ourselves and helping to defend others. And also, um, well... Here it says, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, now that's the word of God, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So God's word, scripture, is profitable for all these things, for teaching us and correcting us. Sometimes we as Christians need correction. We need a better understanding of things. We need God to come to us and the Holy Spirit to to use his scalpel of the word of God to get in there and, and do some surgery on us sometimes. You know, we need, we need to be worked on just as much as the sinner in the gutter. Uh, you know, and the word of God is there to work on us. It's there to, to correct us. It's there to protect us from Satan's onslaughts. It's there for all of these purposes. We need it for that. And then we need prayer, our communication device. And we always need a good connection. We need to stay in touch with our supreme commander. If we have all the other pieces of equipment, but we don't have good communication with our command post, we're in trouble. And Psalm 91.15 he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. <clears throat> and uh, there's this ongoing battle between good and evil, between God's forces and the devil's forces. And we're caught in the middle of it. And the devil either wants to destroy us or get us to join his side, which that ends up in destruction too. But he's after us to try to get us on his side at least. And so we're fighting for the cause of righteousness, for God's kingdom. But we have a personal battle. There are things going on in our lives that need to be dealt with. And uh, on our own, we, we don't stand a chance. 
we're not capable of defending ourselves. We need all of these things that we have here as our defense from whatever Satan wants to do. You know, David didn't have any armor on, and he was smaller than Goliath. And by himself, just as a teenager, he didn't stand a chance against Goliath. But he came out with the armor of God, and Goliath was no match for that. Some years ago when I was farming, um, I went out in the springtime and I was going to cultivate one of the fields to get it ready for for planting. And I was driving a big tractor. It wasn't quite like this, but it was similar. And I came around the, the outside of the field getting, you know, doing the initial uh, cultivation around the outside. And I came around to one end of the field and all of a sudden here came a rooster pheasant out of the grass beside the field. And he came out there and he was flapping his wings and he was crowing at me and he was running right toward the tractor. He was challenging me to try to get me out of his territory. And, you know, he, he stood no, no chance against that tractor, but he was trying to chase me out of his territory. Well, just about when I almost ran over him, he finally dodged out of the way and I went on by and uh, went around the field and I came around the second time and he came out again at me. He was challenging me, you know, he was telling me, you're in my territory, you get out. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So I stopped the tractor, and I got out and I walked toward him. Well, I don't know why that made a difference, but he finally ran off to the side again. And I continued on and, and accomplished my cultivation there. But when I thought about uh, what was going on there, I thought, you know, that's kind of like us and the devil. By ourselves, we're kind of like that pheasant going up against the tractor. That pheasant had no chance to win that battle. But with God on our side, we're like the tractor, and the devil is like the pheasant. He doesn't stand a chance. You know, we have this verse. If God is for us, who can be against us? We have the assurance that if we have on the armor of God, and I'm going to just back up here to that list of armor there. If we have all these things in place, the devil doesn't stand a chance. No matter what happens, we come out on top. And so, you know, we can be reassured that God is on our side. He's backing us up. He gives us all the equipment we need, <clears throat> and we'll win. We have the assurance of victory over the devil, over whatever he wants to do, over his temptations, over whatever trouble he sends at us, no matter what it is, we'll come out okay. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for being our defense, for being there to support us, to reassure us with your promises, to give us defense against Satan and whatever he throws at us. Just pray that we would keep in touch with you keep our connection with you and that we would be on your side. And if you are on our side, if you are for us, nobody else can stand a chance against us. We thank you for that. Be with us through the rest of this Sabbath and uh, guide us through life and help us to depend on you. Remind us that we can depend on you and that you're there for us. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. As always, that blended right in perfectly. They all seem to go together. It's amazing. Especially so, when one doesn't know what the other one's going to speak on, huh? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing how God coordinates things sometimes. But you know, Kimber, you started and ended with the scripture of God before us, who can be against us? Here a while back I was reading something, I don't even remember what, but it said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Some somebody answered, if God be for us, what difference does it make who's against us? Yeah, you know, 
we we sometimes forget that, but that's the truth. You know, it doesn't matter what comes at us. That's why we can have peace and we can be bold. Yeah. The way David was. You can stand up against the opposition. You really have to have him in your mind to do that too. Yeah. Because it's easy with our human eyeballs to see things and be like, <gasps> but yep. Yeah. Just don't be like Peter and look at the waves and forget to and you know keep our eyes off of our savior. Keep our eyes on him and we won't notice the stuff around us. Yeah, it's kind of like that that story of Elisha when the Syrian army came out to get him. And his servant got up in the morning and saw the Syrian army and he like, oh, no, what are we going to do now? And Elisha came out and he said, he prayed, Lord, open his eyes. And when he opened his eyes, he saw the defense. <clears throat> yeah. And that's, and <clears throat> well, I think it's been a great day. Of course, it's not over yet, but for us, it will be. But um I wanted, I wanted to just let everybody know that's watching that, um, of course, Wednesday we have prayer meeting, but the 23rd, um, next Sabbath, um, I think we'll have testimonies at first so people can have prayer requests and say what God has done for them and help people get their minds in order for the following Monday, which is Day of Atonement. And uh, we'll also have a presentation next Sabbath. But anyway, I thought we'd start out that way. That's always kind of good to have, let people talk. And um, then, of course, Wednesday after that, we'll have prayer meeting. But on the 30th, we will start with um, Tabernacles. And the first, there, it's eight days long, and it starts on the 30th. And Pacific time, we will start at 8 o'clock the first four days and we'll go 8, 9, 10, 11, approximately, depending on how long or short people are. And then the um, last four days, we will start at 9. And it's it has them for most all of it. So I think we'll do good. It'll be a good one to have a variety of speakers, different talks. So I think it'll be good. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Shabbat Shalom and uh, uh, Shana Tova, Happy Jewish uh, slash Biblical New Year, 5784. This is Mark, your Jewish Adventist friend, Mark, here in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and uh, I just uh, tuned in late. I've been very busy attending services for the first day of the uh, Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. I was at a Messianic Jewish congregation this morning for services, and we're on our way to uh, one of the counties, couple counties in Maryland. We have what they call Tosh Lake where we symbolically throw, it's a throwing stones in the water, throwing stones is which is symbolic of Yeshua or our Lord uh, doing, you know, doing, you know, uh, casting, uh, taking us sins away and all that. And we have a picnic and so forth. So it's a very busy day today. It's good weather here. A great way to start the Jewish last biblical new year. And so I want to wish everyone this, and I'm hoping this will be the year our Lord returns quickly. So I just want to, you know, Shanda Tova, did you all, by the way, did you all play the show for or anything like that? We heard the show for in the uh, synagogue this morning. Now, I tried on mine, but it didn't work. But I also wanted to make a comment real quick. I realize you're Jewish, but they are yes. God's days. You keep saying the Jewish New Year and stuff, but we These believe. Are God's holidays, not Jewish holidays. They're not only for the Jews. Oh, I guess what I mean, you, that's what I said, biblical. Yeah, I know that, but. Um, for the purposes, that's why I'm using um, where I live. It's a, uh, unfortunately, it's a different, uh, strictly Jewish community. They call it Jewish. So I'm using the Jewish last biblical, uh, you know, in that respect. Uh, we also call it um, Yom Teruah, which is the word Yom means day, and Teruah means the um, the blowing of the shofar. So it's a, because it's the commandment to hear the uh, shofar or the trumpet blast. So that's what that's what that all, what this day is all about. So a lot of it is uh, what we're doing is part of it's uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish customs or traditions. But we are we had a lot there were a lot of Gentiles there at services today. So which is good, you know. I just wanted to make mention. So it's not just for us Jews, obviously. You get the idea, right? We do it, and we usually blow a shofar every Sabbath. I just um, 
haven't been able to get it to work right. So you get on there and okay, you can. Right, I understand. Well, anyway, I'm just hoping we call this, uh, what we call, how we call it, this is we're one day closer to Yeshua's return. And remember First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, it's a great promise. Hope that the Lord will return and take us home uh, with the uh, shofar of the trumpet blast. So that's what the main theme of this day is all about, as believers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that in our talks today, they were good. Can Thank you blow the shofar okay. for us? Thank you. Uh, guys. Me? No, I'm in a. I'm riding in a car, so oh. on our way to this talk so I could, you know, and I can't blow. I don't have the wind power. Uh, uh, you'll be hearing my uh, uh, breath uh, breathing, and that's all you're going to be able to hear. I can't blow blow no show for at all. I can do other things, not that. I don't have that type of uh, skill. Well, Daddy could sure do it. I can't. I have one okay. here, and I can make a sound. My grandson comes over, he's four, four and a half. He walks around with it. He, of course, doesn't make any noise. Oh, good, Mazel. He's so cute. Mazel <laughs> so, Well, anyway, and Kevin, you had a very good, even though I came on for a brief few minutes late because of the, the we're just trying to get him through a schedule today, but it was very good. The, the, the shield of righteousness and the, the breastplate, you know, and everything was a very good analogy. Uh, so Mazel through your presentation. Well, praise the Lord. All right, thank you. Thank you. Right. Come on. Okay. Anything to say or before we go? Everybody just sitting there? Wendy? I'm here. Yeah. Oh, you're talking to me? No, just anybody have anything to say before this we go. A wonderful start to the fall festivals. And yes. If this is any indication of what's coming, I can't wait. It's going to be good. Neither can I. They're no, always good. I'm looking forward to all of it. Me too. And I missed, I missed here, Bella, and been able to see everybody there, but I do believe it was in God's hands or I would still be there. So there's a reason. Okay. And we haven't quit yet. We're still going. So. God is in control yeah. of it. Uh, by the way, do one question. This is from Mark here. Do you know how many uh, listenership do we have from Africa now that are, now that we're on satellite? Or have you gotten any response? I have no idea. I have had some response, but I have no idea. They just find it. I had somebody call from Canada that is uh, watching that. Oh, know, I, a lot of people. I just know that there's a lot of them out there watching. So. We continue. God would have okay. let it happen. Even if he had one person that needed to hear it, he would have found that money for me. So it's okay with me. Okay. Well, you all have a good Sabbath. Okay. You guys do too. Thank you. Thank you. Shabbat Shalom and Happy New Year. B'Shem Yeshua. Okay. Thank you, Mark. You too. You too. You too. Shalom. Bye-bye.